Please remain standing, if you're able, for our gospel lesson today from Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Then the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that whoever tells father or mother, whatever support you might have had from me is given to God, then that person need not honor the father. So, for the sake of your tradition, you make void the word of God, you hypocrites. Isaiah prophesied rightly about you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The word of God for the people of God. God. Please be seated. And let us pray. Oh Lord, I pray that you will take the words from my lips and the meditations of our hearts and make them yours, that we might hear your word, your thoughts, and become the doers of them through Christ who is the word made flesh. Amen. Today we're going to conclude our home improvement series. Uh, Building a Solid Lifestyle with the Master Carpenter. And if you missed any of the messages uh, over the past few weeks, you can get them on our YouTube channel. So go to our website and click the link and you can get all of those there. Now we started with the foundation of uh, the home, of our homes. That is the church, which is the family of God. And the church is to support and uh, make better everything that goes on in the home, whether it's enhancing marriages or parenting um, or all the things that we do as couples and singles. It is also the place where singles are to find their voice. And too often that doesn't happen. But this is the place where it is supposed to happen, where singles realize that they're equal and valued participants in the life of the church. It's also the place where children and youth are valued um, and treasured in the church family as a blessing from the Lord. Our focus today is on the blessings that come from growing wise and aging well. To have many years and good health are the crowning glory of a life well lived and uh, It's then we get to have good memories, life lessons, and joyous experiences to reflect upon and celebrate. Proverbs 20, 29 says, Gray hair is the splendor of the old. I'm feeling a lot of splendor now, (laughs) more than I used to. We call this time in life the golden years, don't we? Yet for far too many, it's not so golden. What is it that tarnishes the gold for so many people. Well, for one, we're living so much longer than we used to, and with that comes a a lot of other issues of growing old. There's an increase, unfortunately, in dementia, and we're seeing a lot more of that as people age longer. Uh, Then there's other diseases that come along, and we require um, more from our bodies over more time and our bodies weaken don't they and, and we can't produce and do like we used to uh, and we wish we could and then if we keep living long enough there's the need for replacement parts right <laughs> and so we get those new knees and hips and, and uh, but with that comes some financial burdens and expenses and that can be a hardship Uh, in the golden years, going to the doctor more often. And with the need for more health care and care homes, um, it, it changes our lives. If you live long enough, you're going to lose your friends and your family. Uh, and sometimes that 
can leave you feeling all alone. It's what happened with my father. He was the last one living of his generation and, and my family. And he just couldn't understand why it was called the golden years. It was not golden for him at all. When he got into his 90s though, I said, well, no, it's not the golden years for you. Once you reach your 90s, it's the platinum years, right? <laughs> That's where Edana is here in, in those platinum years. But my father had lost, his, lost my mother and, and all of his friends. And it became increasingly difficult for him to, to do all that he wanted to do. I had to do more and more. I even got to the point where he couldn't drive anymore. I had to start driving him to the store and other places he wanted to go. One of the greatest fears of growing older is losing independence, isn't it? Because we want to always keep driving. We want to live in our own homes. And sometimes we can't. It's no wonder that we like to put off aging all that we can. And so uh, some of us take supplements for that. Others might use wrinkle cream. I don't know how we do that, but no one wants to think that they're old or, or look old. And we don't want to be called old. And, and uh, most people don't think they're old. And that's good. Um, researchers have found of people over 80 years old, only 53% consider themselves old. 36% of those over 80 consider themselves in middle age. And then there's the 11% that thinks they're still young. <laughs> I think uh, George Bush was one of those, wasn't he? He'd keep jumping out of airplanes in his, in his 80s. Um, but age is a relative thing, isn't it? And I recently found out how old is. You want to know how old old is? <laughs> Researchers have found out that it, people think old is just 15 years older than you are. So you teenagers, maybe if you're 15, you think 30 is old. <laughs> and if we're 50, we think 65 is getting old. And, and so on and on. Age is a relative thing. Morton Puner, in his book, tells of a 76-year-old man who was clearly out of his head. He had been moved to a nursing home after being treated in the hospital for heart failure and within a few days he was feeling so much better that he insisted that they call his mother to pick him up and take him home. <laughs> well the nurses had seen a lot of confusion among the elderly and, and uh, they, they figured well he's, he's just confused right now and, and they thought nothing of the request and they just kept telling them now, just calm down, everything's going to be okay. Privately they decided to keep him a few more weeks to see if his mental confusion would clear up. And um, they, uh, you know, after that time um, Hoped that it would improve. Eventually, though, his 95-year-old mother with her 97-year-old sister did drive her car 100 miles to come pick up her little boy and take him home. <laughs> People have often a negative image of growing old because I think our society does. Um, growing old is, is, is not celebrated like it used to, believe it or not. We have demeaning sayings like, over the hill. Uh, we have lots of jokes, don't we, about growing old. Three things happen when you get older. First, you lose your memory. And I can't remember the other two. <laughs> In the movie Grumpier Old Men that came out years ago, you remember uh, Grandpa Gustafson, Gustafson played by Burgess Meredith, was sitting on a bench one day and he said uh, to the one sitting next to him, last Thursday I just turned 95 years old and I'm still here. Huh. Sometimes I wonder if God's remembered me. <laughs> How we think of and treat the elderly has a lot to say about us as a culture. Often older ones are forgotten and, and I think John Gunther is one of the best to go visit them. He can tell you probably every name of uh, 
the ones that elder care because he goes over there. And so many have nobody to visit them. We're the first society in history to ignore and isolate elderly on a large scale. For most of history, there was no such thing as nursing homes. For most of history, the elderly lived with their families and participated in life with them. And yet, on the other hand, we are the longest living society and long-term nursing care is often a necessity with the complex problems that come uh, with growing old. And I held off as long as I could, and I'm thankful those facilities are there, and I had to use it for both of my parents because my mother had severe dementia and, and required a lot of care, and my father, thankfully, was only two months in a nursing home, but it was more than I could do by myself and keep working and p keep being a father and grandfather to my children. So there are times that we need to do that. But never should elderly be forgotten or isolated even if they're put there. In biblical times it was far different. Growing old was seen as an honor and a privilege to be old. Proverbs 16.31 says, Gray hair is a crown of splendor and is attained by a righteous life. Growing old was seen as a blessing and, and the people who were older were continually honored and given great privileges. In our scripture from Leviticus that Paula read, it, t it tells us there that how we treat our elderly is directly linked to how much we revere the Lord. Directly linked. And I believe that's why uh, Jesus was so upset with the Pharisees. Because they had come up with this tradition as an excuse to break God's command and ignore the special needs of aging parents. And this tradition was called in some translations, Korban. You remember that name, some uh, revised standards. Some of the older translations have the word Korban, which means gift. It means to, and that was used to ignore the elders. If someone declared that the amount needed to support his or her parents was devoted to God, then the scribes would release them from their duty. Well, the Apostle Paul follows up on Jesus' words, doesn't he, when he says that if we fail to take care of our families, we have denied our faith and we're worse than an unbeliever. Jesus says nothing can excuse us from God's priorities, even if it's cloaked in religious garb. If we're devoted to God, then we're devoted to each other. And we're going to take care of each other, especially our valuable older adults who oftentimes become so vulnerable. What does it mean then to give honor to the elderly? Well, the Hebrew term literally means weight. And what it means here is that they are big, to be given weight in community life. They are to be given priority. And uh, oftentimes in ancient societies, um, they were given the most priority. Today we give most priority to our children, don't we? At the expense of our elderly. Yeah, we need to value our children, and we talked about that. But the elderly are supposed to have the highest honor in our society. Why? Because they've, they've done their part and are retired? No. Nowhere does the Bible ever speak of retirement. Retirement is a modern concept. Didn't exist for most of history. The reason they are to be given weight is because they still have so much to contribute to us and we are to appreciate not just all that they have done, but all that they continue to do. Just like Ruth in her 80s continuing to play that organ. And Ruth continues to, to learn and how to do it better. What an example for us. Amen. What an example. Those who we call elders have more experience, wisdom, and a sense of history. Now my dad was the last living elder in my family. 
And he was my connection. My connection to the people in the past. He lived through the Great Depression. And I, I felt like I was somehow connected to that through his stories. He connected me to other family members who had passed on. He, it was his life that even helped me still even feel a little more connected to my mother who had already been dead for about 10 years. But when he died, I have to tell you, I felt cut off. I felt cut off from everybody in my past because I didn't have any aunts or uncles. There was nobody uh, beyond my age in my family to talk to anymore. I felt disconnected when he died. You know, one of the worst things, I think, is if we ignore the voices of our elders. We only have them for a short time. And once that voice is gone, it's really silent, isn't it? Even though we can recall the memories, we still don't get to say, hey, Dad, what do you think about this? Did you hear what I did the other day? If we don't have a good sense, though, of our history, which our, our elders help us with, we're doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. You know, I, I was a history major, and I can appreciate that. And that, that was the main reason to learn history, so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And our elders are the living history, aren't they? They're far more interesting than, than dull, dry textbooks. They can make the stories come alive. And oh, how I love to hear the stories. I keep hearing newer, more and more stories. I've only been here three years. But the stories you have about Epworth and, and your families, about Ripley and this community and all the great things uh, that have happened here. What a story you have with this church. This church came together from two churches. They were started in the 1800s. And back after the Civil War, there were two churches in this community. One went with the north and one went with the south. But in 1939, the denomination came together. And you chose to come together as one church. What a beautiful story of reconciliation you have as Epworth. And oh how we need that story today when there's so much division and polarization going on in our society. We've got to find a way to reconcile and to come together again as Americans and as people in our community. What a great story. And then there was the fire. And that's a, that's a story that marks so many of you. In 1955, this church burned down. And then you built this beautiful sanctuary I think it was finished around 56 and dedicated in 57. And, and uh, what's amazing is you got it paid off right when it was done. I think Dr. Hughes said that, that you were able to raise $40,000 in four days. Is that right? That's amazing. Wow. How did you do that? <laughs> How are we going to continue to be good, generous givers like that today? What a story. What a story this, this building is. It's a story of faith. It's a story of love. It's a story of sacrifice and commitment. That's what this building is. It represents. No, we don't worship a building. But it's the stories that, that go into this building to make it so special. It's our history that helps us to know from whence we have come who we are, and whose we are. When we, don't, when we know that, we'll have a better idea of where we need to go into the future. You see, our past really helps determine our future. And so we need to know our past and, and celebrate our past. And we're going to do this November the 16th and 17th as we have a great homecoming, celebrate the 20th anniversary of another building here, it, uh, the, the fellowship center. It's not the fellowship center we celebrate. It's the stories and the people who went in to, to build that and have the vision that we get to enjoy it today as our reality. Yes, our past helps determine our future. And if we don't pay attention to and honor our elders, we'll be left to the voices of the age, tossed to and fro 
by every fad that comes our way. And that's what Paul warns the church about in 2 Timothy. He warns us of the danger when we're not rooted in our faith and our history. Yes, we need all of you who are older to help all of us who are younger to know the word of God and to live it and, and, and for you to mentor us, to help us to learn and to be faithful Christians. I think we honor them best by listening to them and hopefully putting into practice the wise teachings that they have for us. You know, a wise person learns from his or her mistakes, right? But a wiser person will learn from somebody else and perhaps their mistakes. And uh, so we have so much to learn so that we can not just avoid our mistakes, but we can do life better. Live life better because of those who have come before us. Mark Twain had an interesting saying. When he was growing up, he didn't think his parents knew very much. But he was amazed when he got older how much his parents had learned. <laughs> not only will the older generation benefit the younger generations, the younger can be a great help to the older. And next week you're going to get to experience that. You're going to be blessed by our younger ones uh, with their expressions of worship. Uh, it, it, it's great, isn't it? Because younger ones can inspire us who are older. It, it's a mutual um, uh, exchange. My daughter works for uh, Judge Joseph Gooden, Goodwin. You know him as Joe Bob here, right? She works for him in Charleston as, as his federal clerk in his office. And I was there and, and spoke with him recently. And he says, you know, I'd like to retire, but it's these younger ones that work with me that keep it so interesting. And I was glad my daughter could be one of those. You see, younger generations are so important to keep those of us who are older younger or thinking younger uh, all the changes that are happening, they can help us understand and learn things. And, and I admire so many of you who are in your 80s and 90s that are learning all this new technology. You know, I, I see uh, Jo Ellen and she's there on her smartphone just learning things. But I'm willing to bet that for most of us, we learned it from a younger person. A younger person helped us to learn how to use this technology the younger ones can help us when we need a hand and our bodies and our minds will begin to fail and we need, we need our younger ones as well. A person who is really wise though never stops learning. Age has nothing to do with wise. I know people in their 70s who are very foolish who never seem to learn. So age doesn't guarantee wisdom but we can continue to learn and to grow and if we stop, that's when we grow old. Scientists say for most of us, our minds can stay sharp indefinitely. And so we have people like Adana here in her 90s who is sharp. And, and one of the reasons she's so sharp is she keeps doing new things and she keeps getting out there and going to plays in Ohio and Pennsylvania and, and she can run circles around me. <laughs> but you got to keep learning. You got to keep growing because if you if you don't use it you're going to lose it nowhere does it say in the bible that i've i've done my part i'm i'm done that's not there to think that is to deny god's power and possibilities at every stage in our lives if you read acts chapter 2 it says the holy spirit was poured out on old men and old women to dream new dreams and see new visions. Abraham and Sarah were in their 90s when they had their first little baby. And then there's Anna and Simeon. You read in Luke. They're in their 80s. And they're there getting out and worshiping. And because they did that, they got to see little baby Jesus at his circumcision. And bless him and prophesy about him to his parents, Mary and Joseph. What a shame it would have been. If they'd said, oh, we're just too old. We're not good for anything now. 
John Wesley, our founder in Methodism, he kept preaching into his 80s. And when he was so sick that he couldn't get out of bed, he still kept doing something. He wrote letters and he advised people who would come and visit him. Whenever someone says, I have done my part, you might as well just give up on life. And then you really will be old. Now, it may not be the same part. You may do something different because you're not able to do some of the things you did before. But there is always a part to play in God's church. It's the dream that keeps us fresh and alive. Our minds and our bodies start to deteriorate when we cease looking forward. When we stop to grow and serve and share with one another. The minute we stop growing, trying new things is when we lose touch with our purpose which is to live for Christ, it's then we begin to die. There's always a new thing that the Lord wants to do. Always a new thing in us and through us. And some of the greatest blessings have come to me from those in their 80s and their 90s because they, they just never stop. They keep growing. I, I admire my brother-in-law, Ben. He's 92 years old. He's lost most of his friends, but he's still young. He's a young 92. And one of his secrets is he continues to make new friends with those younger than him. When we keep Christ before us, we can continue to see dreams and grow and love and serve so that when our final day does come, we can join the Apostle Paul in saying, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course I have kept the faith. What a way to go. And I hope that's for all of us. We're going to go strong when we go because we've lived strong and dynamic lives. We, we never give up on growing and learning and experiencing life at its best. Those of you who are our elders in this congregation, and we've got great ones. You all are really, really great you are truly a gift from the Lord. May you never feel unappreciated. May you never feel like we don't need you in all that we're doing now. May you always feel the presence and the power of God to use you and to bless you. May we continue to see that God, in God's beautiful family, we need each other. Younger and older. And one of the takeaways I hope that you have from this series is that we find ways to continue to connect our young people and our older people together because we need the enrichment that comes from that. Uh, I'll talk to Paula some more, but I'd love to have like adopt a grandparent or adopt the grandchild so that we'll connect, find ways to connect. Um, we're going to have uh, prayer uh, cards going out for, for all of our young people. Lisa Bailey's working on that, that we have a prayer partner for every one of us with our young people because there's a lot of great things happening on Sunday night with our young people. We're having, you know, several dozen of them coming out on Sunday evenings and growing in their faith. And then I want us to think about when we are older and uh, that we find ways to connect with each other, to support each other, to keep each other healthy. Because we do it better together. And thankful for Sue and doing that with the exercise group and, and others who, who come together. And we need to do that for our faith. You know, the, part of the secret of the power of early Methodism was that they kept meeting together weekly in small groups. And they empowered and encouraged each other to grow. And it just didn't happen by accident. We need to find ways to come together because in Christ we are family we are family now and forevermore let's live it and let's share it so that all the world will know and come into let's pray Almighty God, we thank you for this family, this church family. And it is a family that is all around the world, wherever Christ is lifted up. 
Lord, we thank you for all those who have come before us so that we know so many blessings today. We thank you for uh, those who are, are continuing to be with us as our seniors, as our, our elders in this congregation, and all that they do uh, even now to keep this church strong and vital and help us to learn from them. And I thank you for the young people in our church who, who are growing in Christ and learning from those who, who love them and get connected into their lives. Help us, oh God, to enrich each other, to become the beautiful family that we were meant to be so that others will see your love at work and want to join in too, to become a follower of Jesus who is our elder brother all under the leadership of you, O oh Father, through the power and the grace and the strength of your Holy Spirit. Help us, O oh God, to continue to grow as your family. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let us join in and remember that we are united together by God's grace. Let's stand and sing. you remember the prayer quilt is here so please come and tie some knots and say a prayer for Dr. Swan please as we sing our next two verses So linger as long as you need to to come and tie a knot and say a prayer and then head to the fellowship center as we uh, celebrate uh, Ruth and Don and uh, get some good refreshments that are there waiting for you. So let's celebrate and enjoy our family fellowship together. May we go now in that grace and love and joy that is ours through God in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.